Thank you, worship team. You know, it's, it's so great uh, seeing um, different people involved in so many things. Uh, Darren filling in for me for the kids, did a great job. Uh, of course, Derek and James and, uh, and Jason, the worship team. Uh, Caleb, that electric guitar, it's a nice, nice touch. I really, really like that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a joy to see um, different people stepping up and, and really, really serving. Uh, makes, makes my heart glad. Galatians 3 is where we are in our study. We'll be in verses 15 through 29 this morning. Uh, you know, Wednesday nights, uh, we've just been getting into a study that I've titled Storyline, Creation to Christ. And, and the whole purpose of it is to trace through the storyline of Scripture, to take all these stories and to show how they fit together and, most importantly, how they point to Christ. So just a couple of weeks ago when we started this series, uh, I shared in the introduction uh, to the series that my journey to understanding the storyline of Scripture and its connection to Christ uh, really began as a student at Oklahoma Baptist University. You know, I was raised in the church. Uh, I was very serious about my faith. I sensed a call to ministry at a young age. But now as a Bible major, uh, as a freshman at OBU, for the first time in my life, I came to understand the connection between Abraham and Jesus. And I was actually a little bit embarrassed, right? Because, I mean, I had been uh, in the church my whole life. I had, I had been so serious about my faith. I mean, part of that was my fault, but I guess uh, we might say that I wasn't taught everything that I should have been taught. That's what I am seeking to do here, but um, I, I realized that there was a lot that I didn't know, and of course, that's just true for all of us at any time, right? We're all on a journey, but uh, whenever, some, whenever that first connection clicked with me, Abraham to Christ, I realized, okay, wait, all of this is connected. This, this is one grand story, and I got really excited about it and uh, have been ever since then. The connection between Abraham and Christ in particular uh, relates very well to our passage this morning. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to see how the promise made to Abraham and to his offspring is indeed fulfilled in Christ. And so if you know a little bit about Abraham, you might remember, uh, you know, Abraham, he's just kind of minding his own business one day and God comes to him and he says, hey, pick up everything you have, take it, go to a land that I will show you. And he makes a promise, or really a, kind of a handful of promises to Abraham. He says that you'll have many descendants, right? That he says, look at the stars in the heaven uh, and count them if you can. So will your descendants be. And he promises that they will become a great nation. And he promises that they will inherit this land that God leads him to. This is the land of Canaan, which is uh, what we also know as the promised land. This is the land that Moses later brings the people into, right? This promise is indeed fulfilled, they inherit the land. They become this great nation. But he also says to Abraham this. He says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, how is that? I mean, we, 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 we see that, yes, they come and they inherit the land. But how, how can this one tiny nation of Israel be a blessing to all the families of the earth? This is what I didn't get. But this is so important, right, that through the lineage of Abraham, which is the Jewish people, right? Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. It's from, from his offspring that this great nation came. And it was from the Jewish people or the people of Israel that the Messiah would come to redeem all of those who trust in him. And so this promise is a major focus of our passage. Uh, the near promise, right, of this fulfillment, but, but most importantly, this greater eternal promise for all who trust in Jesus, the seed of Abraham. Let me just pause here and say that there are a lot of promises in Scripture. And of course, it's important for us to understand them in their proper context, etc. But 2 Corinthians 1.20 just cries out whenever I think of all this. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to the glory, to God for his glory. Right? The hymn here is Jesus. All of God's promises find their yes in 
Jesus. So we were just talking about this in Sunday school this morning. You know, as we go through the Old Testament, understand that uh, it's, it's not just some kind of like isolated time and place, uh, but it all connects to Jesus, and it all finds its fulfillment in Jesus. All right, so again, this promise to Abraham is a major focus of our passage. And in light of this promise, Paul asks a question. He says, what then was the purpose of the law? And so really we're going to discuss, we're going to look in this passage and see what the passage has to say about this promise to Abraham, but also how the law fits in with all this, right? The law that was given through Moses. This is, I think, the most difficult section in Galatians. And so let me just share the points on the front end, okay? The first point is this, that God's promise of redemption through the seed of Abraham has not changed. It never changed. God made this promise, and he kept this promise, and yet there's, there's still yet more to be fulfilled as Christ returns and brings it all to fruition. But God's promise of redemption through the seed of Abraham has not changed. Number two, the law was given not to replace the promise, but to prepare us for it. Okay? So keep those in mind as I read this passage. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? Galatians 3, verses 15 through 29. This is also a more lengthy passage. So we have a challenge before us this morning. I hope you're up to it. This is a lengthier passage, and it's also a more difficult passage. But um, I had to make a choice here, right? We, we, we could look at every verse and kind of just tease it to death for week after week after week, or we could hit it all at once because really this is all making one argument. In fact, uh, even as we move into the uh, passage next week, it kind of continues this argument. Uh, so with that said, we'll begin in verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediator. Inter- intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given, if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would, would be revealed. And so then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. This is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. God, we pray for your help. Uh, today as we dig into this passage. Help us to understand, um, but help us also to have the right balance to not get too bogged down in some of the confusing aspects of this passage. Help us to not miss the forest for the trees. Help us to see uh, the main points that you have for us in the passage and how they apply to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so that, uh, that passage was a mouthful right? And uh, I think you can see how there are some very perplexing portions of this passage. And so I want to bring some clarity, um, but as I just said uh, in my prayer, I, I don't want us to miss the forest for the trees. Uh, so I'm going to paint with some broader strokes this morning. And let's just go ahead and, and look at these two points again, because these are going to kind of serve as our anchor, okay? Okay. 
And so again, these are the two main points of the passage. First is that God's promise of redemption through the seed of Abraham has not changed. And number two, the law was given not to replace the promise, but to prepare us for it. All right, so we'll begin with this first point. God's promise of redemption through the seed of Abraham has not changed. Paul begins with an example. Verse 15, he says this, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. It may more specifically be a will that Paul has in mind here. Uh, This fits with the classical Greek usage of the word. And a will is indeed a man-made covenant, right? So his point is, he's making a comparison, right? Uh, We have a covenant with God, right? That is the covenant that's made with Abraham and God. But then even in a man-made covenant, such as a will, for example, he says once it has been ratified, it cannot be changed, Right, that's his major point in this first verse. Now, even in wills today, it's certainly true that after death, it's set, right? Uh, once you have died, your will is set. No one can change it. But in the ancient Greco-Roman world, there was a law that even before death, once it was written, it could not be changed, right? So if you write your will and you promise uh, your youngest son your Hot Wheels collection, And then he kind of goes off the deep end and you say, oh, no, I want to take that back. Well, too bad. You can't do it. It's been ratified. It's been written. Changed. And so he probably has that Greco-Roman law in mind. But the point is that, okay, even with man-made covenants, there's an unchangeableness about them. How much more than is that true with a covenant that God makes with us, with a divine covenant. You know, so easily we can get answers. And yet we think, okay, well, maybe something's changed, right? Maybe, maybe it's not going to quite go down the way that he says. Maybe I should do something different than what this lays out for me. We can get antsy, right? We can get impatient. In fact, even Abraham himself fell to that. On one hand, we see Abraham was uh, a great example of faith, right? God tells him to pick up his stuff and go and... Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In fact, that is used as an example for us, how uh, if we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are counted as righteous, right? The whole point of Galatians is that we're not saved by works of the law. It's not about how good we can be, but it's about believing and trusting in Jesus. And so just as Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness, so it is with us. So he's a good example there, but even Abraham faltered because he was promised that he would have these many descendants, but, well, there's a problem. First of all, he and his wife both were very old, but his wife was also barren. And so he thinks, okay, well, how in the world is God going to fulfill this promise uh, if my wife is barren, if my wife can't have any children? And so he and his, his wife is actually in on this. He decides to conceive with his servant girl, Hagar. Right? And they have Ishmael. But then God tells him, he says, no, 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 no. It will not be through this seed, but I will give you a seed through your wife, Sarai, whose name later is changed to Sarah. And so you see, he, he, he kind of, he saw the impract- impracticalness of what God had laid out. And he said, oh, okay, I'm going I'm to do this my own way. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to kind of intervene here to make sure this happens. And sometimes we can do that ourselves, can't we? God's word lays something out for us, and we say, well, you know, I know that God's word says this. This might be true in church life. It can be true in relationships. Fill in the blank. I know that God's word says this, but, you know, this is kind of a special situation. Um, I think God would understand if, if we did it this way instead. Well, we must trust that God does not change his word. He does not change his promises. We stick to the script, stick to what he has given us. And we trust in him. And that that requires patience, right? I mean, sometimes we see this play out over generations in Scripture. Sometimes we don't want to wait two weeks 
but we see that God has a different timetable than we do. Right? Even this promise given to Abraham. I mean, it's, it's about 2,000 years later that it's fulfilled in Christ, but is unfolding all along the way, and he has a purpose in it all. Verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. All right, so here's where it begins to get confusing. I think it's, a, I think it's confusing enough in the original language, but even more so in English, because we don't even use the word offsprings, right? So it kind of sounds like a strange argument. Oh, notice he says offspring, not offsprings. Well, whoever uses the word offsprings. Um, some translations translate it as seeds and seed. I think that might be a little bit more helpful. That connects with us more, I think, in the English language, right? And so we could read it like this. Uh, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. It doesn't say to his seeds, referring to many, but referring to one. And your seed, who is Christ. All right, so... Here, here's the deal. Um, the word that's used here, the Greek word that could be translated offspring or seeds, it is a singular word, but it is also a collective. It, it, just, just like you know, we could say offspring or we could play, say seed and mean many. Right? There is a, a collective nature to the word. So it still can refer to many, but the point that Paul is making here is that while, yes, there are many offspring or offsprings that uh, Abraham has, that the promise was kind of focusing in on something even more specific, and that there, that, that there would be one offspring or one seed through which all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so that's his point, that, that it's, it, it all comes to Jesus. It all comes to this one seed. And in fact, this fits very well with Genesis 3.15, this uh, this is really the first promise of the gospel that we see in Scripture, right? After Adam and Eve have sinned uh, and God has placed a curse upon creation, and he curses the serpent right, who deceived them. And he says to the serpent this, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right? The he here, this is the singular seed. This is Jesus. So we see this from the very beginning. There is a seed. A seed of the woman will crush or will bruise the head of the serpent. And that is exactly what Jesus has done in his victory over sin and death. Jesus is that singular seed. So it goes back even further from Abraham all the way to this promise made in the book in, in Genesis three fifteen. So again, we see all of the promise of God, promises of God find their yes in him. It all points back to Jesus. Well, the passage continues. Galatians 3, verses 17 through 18. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward, it does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Essentially, this is telling us, don't get thrown off by the giving of the law. Again, we can get antsy. We think, okay, God's not going to come through with his promises. He made this promise to Abraham, but now we have this guy Moses where he gives the law. And so maybe that's the way that we are to be saved, is through the law. Again, this is what the Galatians were dealing with. They were seeking to justify themselves. They were seeking to be saved by works of the law. And so what Paul is saying, he's like, hey, no, this didn't come. This kind of will lead into our next point, right? It didn't come to replace the promise, but it came to prepare us for it. The law was not uh, annulling or voiding God's promise. So don't get thrown off by that is what he's saying. Just as Abraham believed this promise and it was counted to him as righteousness, so it is with us. We are saved by faith in Jesus, by believing in his promise. And so again, Paul is laboring to make clear that the law cannot save us. That's not what it came for. The promise is still the same as it was when it was given to Abraham, and that promise is fulfilled in Christ. A quick word on the word inheritance here. So in verse 18, 
says, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What is this inheritance he's talking about? Well, there was a near fulfillment of this for Abraham or for his offspring in particular, right? That they would inherit this land, right? That they would become a great nation, that they would inherit the promised land. That was fulfilled. But he's talking about something uh, more lasting and eternal than that. Because he's saying, he, he, he's, he's, well, he says, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise, but God gave to Abraham by a promise. And so what he's saying here is that there, there is an eternal inheritance that is still yet to come, right? So just as there was an inheritance given to Abraham and his offspring, well, through our faith in the promise, through our faith in the seed of Abraham, Jesus, there will be an inheritance that we have forever with Christ. We will inherit the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. We will be with Christ forever. There is a promised redemption that comes through the seed of Abraham. There is an inheritance for you and for me if we trust in Jesus. He says it doesn't come through the law. It still comes by this promise going all the way back to Abraham. Or again, we could even go all the way back to Genesis 3.15. There was a promise that God made, and he fulfilled it in Christ. And, and again, we're kind of in an already but not yet phase because it's fulfilled in the sense that Jesus died and rose again, right? He has uh, declared victory over sin and death, and through faith in him we're saved. But he's going to come again, and he's going to you know, finish this um, battle, we might say, with, uh, with sin and death, and he's going to bring about Again, a new heavens and a new earth in which we will live forever with Christ. All right, so again, the major point here is that this comes not through obedience to the law, but it comes through faith in this promise. Number two, the law was given not to replace the promise, but to prepare us for it. So we just keep reading along, all right? So, so he's, he's labored to show that we're still saved through faith, just like Abraham was saved through faith. We cling to this promise that was fulfilled in Jesus. So then why in the world did we have this, you know, uh, goodness, like how long was it? About 1,500 years between Moses and Christ? Why, why in the world did we have this period of the Old Testament law if we are in fact saved by faith through this promise that was given to Abraham? That's the question he asks in verse Eight, in verse 19, why then the law? He says, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. All right, so it was added because of transgressions. Well, what does that mean? Again, this passage is, is difficult. This is a little bit vague, but I think we can get a pretty good idea of what he means here, especially as we consider all that uh, Paul has said concerning transgressions and the law. This is a good opportunity to talk about what, what is called the three uses of the law. And so um, one of the Protestant reformers, John Calvin, he wrote a uh, book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion in which he uh, wrote about the three uses of the law. And so this has kind of been a standard for, for Protestants ever since. Uh, three, three, three uses of the Old Testament law. And so first of all, it is a mirror. Okay? And this is one we've talked about a lot and I think we've seen it clear in Galatians and in, uh, throughout the New Testament. It's the mirror, meaning that it, it reveals our sin and it points us to our need of a Savior. Right? Whenever we read the law of God, it reveals our sin and it shows us our need. It points us to our need for a Savior. Moreover, we've even seen that Romans 5, the law came to increase the trespass. Or Romans 7, when the commandment came, sin came alive. And so there's a sense that uh, the, the law doesn't only reveal sin, but even kind of stirs it up within us. It's not the law's fault, it's, it's our own sinful nature's fault, right? As I've said before, it's kind of the red button syndrome. Don't push the red button. What do we do? We want to push the red button. That's exactly what Paul is getting at in Romans 7. He says it, it, it stirs up all kinds, you know, when I hear the law, do not covet, it stirs up all kinds of covetousness within me. And so really what that's doing is it still is a sense of revealing our sin because it's even bringing to life what lies dormant within us, right? We have sin that lies dormant in our heart and the law can actually kind of bring that to life. So it's an ugly thing when the law bumps up against our sinful flesh, 
And so all that kind of fits into the first use of the law, right? It's a mirror. It shows us who we are. It shows us our need for Christ. But the second use of the law, it might seem a little bit contradictory, but the second use of the law is a restraint of evil. So it might sound a little bit contradictory because, well, hasn't Paul made clear that the law actually stirs sin up within us? Well, that's true in a sense, but I think we all understand the role of restraining evil that the law has. I mean, if you give rules to your children, or if you believe in the government having laws, then you understand how the law can restrain evil, particularly the penalties that come with it, right? Because the law, and this is huge, right? The law alone cannot change the heart, right? That, that's why it must point us to Christ. The law cannot change the heart, but if there are certain penalties that come with it, uh, then it can at least curb sin a little bit, at least outwardly. It can preserve us for at least a time from utter self-destruction. And so the first use of the law is it points us to our need for a Savior. The second use of the law is that it can preserve people, it can preserve societies. And that's what it did for the people of Israel leading up to the coming of the Messiah. I mean, Israel got itself in a lot of trouble, that's for sure. But, but the law played a role in kind of um, curbing their sin a little bit so they didn't uh, completely destroy themselves so that through the nation of Israel, a Savior could come. And likewise, we might think even like leading up to our own conversion, right? God's, God's law is what we might call a common grace. It's even, it, it has its good function even for unbelievers, right? Thou shalt not murder. It's a good thing for us to put that in our laws, right? It protects society. It protects us from our sin. And so that's, that's the second use of the law, this restraint of evil. And uh, it has this preserving effect um, from self-destruction as we await what we really need, and that is salvation through Jesus Christ. So I think when Paul says in verse 19 that the law was added because of transgressions, that he may very well, may, may very well be talking about both of these uses of the law. Right? The law was added so that we can see our sin, so that we can see our need for a Savior, but it was also added, well, as we'll see later as we continue in this passage, that the law was a guardian until Christ came that it, uh, it had a kind of protecting type factor. Again, the purpose of the law was not to replace the promise, but to prepare us for it, or to point us to it, to preserve this people as, the, as they awaited the Messiah. And then finally, there's the third use of the law. And so the first two uses are largely for maybe pre-conversion, but the third use of the law is once we're born again, then God's law can instruct us on how we are to please God. And, and it's, it's a whole new ball game. Once you're born again, once you have that heart of stone taken out and you have a heart of flesh, once you're living by faith, then you can really begin to keep the law. Not perfectly, not in this life, but you can actually begin to really obey God's law with, with a, a heart of faith. As I always say, you can't get the heart, cart before the horse, right? Paul's whole point in Galatians is, if, if you rely on the law to save you, then uh, that's bad news. But if you come to Christ in faith and you have faith in him, then the law has its place in our lives. Now, again, as we've talked about, uh, there is, now that we're in the new covenant, we don't have all these civil and ceremonial laws, these 613 laws that are laid out in, in the old covenant. For example, we don't make sacrifices anymore. We don't have to follow these food laws. Um, and so the New Testament addresses that, and that's a, a very complex discussion. But I think that it's, uh, at least on the base level, clear that something's different in the new covenant. And so we are no longer under the law of Moses, but there, of course, is an eternal moral law of God that still applies to us. And even the law of Moses can inform us on that. All right, so those are the three uses of the law, okay? Remember, there's the mirror, number one. Number two is the restraint of evil. And then number three is, as born-again believers, then it can instruct us um, in, in a more helpful way. All right. So we're digging in deep, right? Uh, we're going to keep going here. Uh, verse 19 continues 
And it was put in place, the law was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. All right. So, even the Apostle Peter mentions how parts of Paul's letters were hard to understand. And I think this would qualify as one of those parts. What in the world does this mean? I could spend a good 10 minutes going over some speculation, um, but I'm just going to let this stand, partly for the sake of time, but also because I don't, I'm not exactly sure what it means, and I'm not sure how it connects with Paul's argument. And so if, if you want to know what I think about it, um, uh, you can ask me after the service, and I'll comment more on it. Um, but uh, I, again, I don't want to miss the forest for the trees, and so we're just going to let that stand, and we're going to continue on into verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given, so, so, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So again, the major point is the law was not given to replace the promise, but to prepare us for it. And as we move on into the next verses, we'll get a little bit more specific on this. But we've already seen how the law points us to our need for Christ, how it can preserve people and societies, at least for a time, from utter self-destruction. These are the first two uses of the law, and these are the form of preparation uh, that, uh, that I think we see Paul getting at here. All right, it was given to prepare us for this promise or for the fulfillment of the promise. Right? God is eternally wise in everything that he does. He didn't just kind of willy-nilly decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in this whole like, Old Testament law stuff in between this promise to Abraham and the coming of Christ. He did it for a reason, and he did it to prepare God's people for the Messiah. And even for us, as we look back on the Old Testament, as we kind of relive it all, it helps us to understand our need for a Messiah helps us to see how his, uh, well, we see how redemption unfolds throughout the storyline of Scripture. So God prepares us. Just let me say that God is always preparing us in a thousand other ways for whatever he has planned for us. And so there's just a real practical lesson here that, that we should trust God, that he is He's doing something, right? We see it in this large span of time over the Old Testament, but even in our own lives, everything's happening for a reason, right? God is in control, and he is preparing us for whatever he has planned for us, right? He prepared his people for the Messiah through this giving of the law, and again, that even in a way prepares us, but just for everything in our lives. He's preparing us. He is working all things together for our good, Right? For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, that, that, that's one of those precious promises in Scripture that we must cling to. God keeps his promises, and he's, he's preparing us for whatever he has down the line for us. You know, next week we will see uh, one of my favorite lines in Galatians. It says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. In the fullness of time, at just the right time, this is about 1,500 years after uh, the law, or about 2,000 years after this um, promise that was, was made to Abraham. And yet, it was just the right time. And actually, we'll talk next week about some reasons why, uh, kind of looking back at that. We can see some very practical reasons as to why it was just the right time. But we see that God's timing is always right. God's timing in fulfilling this promise to Abraham was just right. And his timing in our life is always just right. Finally, verses 23 through 29. <clears throat> so we'll kind of hit this as a larger chunk. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female. 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> this phrase, heirs according to the promise, is key. Well, remember earlier we were talking about this inheritance? Right? There was an inheritance promised to Abraham, and in there was a near fulfillment of that and, you know, his descendants inheriting the promised land and all that. But there's a greater inheritance, an eternal spiritual inheritance that comes through faith in the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. We are heirs according to the promise. So we see in this, in this section that I just read that until faith came, that is until the gospel of Jesus Christ, the people of Israel were, verse 22, imprisoned under sin. Verse 23, they were captive under the law. Or verses 24 to 25 talks about how they were under a guardian. Right? So uh, Paul is describing here a state that's not ideal. It was never meant to be permanent, but it was necessary for a time. Right? This time of being under the law of Moses. In prison under sin, captive under the law, under a guardian. He hones in specifically on how the law was a guardian. Uh, the Greek word here is... Uh, pedagogos, which is where we get the word pedagogy from, right? Teaching. Um, now, a, a pedagogos in the Greek world was a, a full-time caregiver for a child. And so they had many functions. They would supervise and, and discipline the child, but also there was teaching or maybe reviewing lessons from their tutor. Uh, there was a teaching role there as well. And we see that it very much is like the role of the law for the people of Israel leading up to Christ. Right, the law was a pedag uh, pedagogos, a, 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 a schoolmaster or tutor is, is what some translations um, translate it. Again, here, guardian is the word that's used. And so uh, we see how the law was a guardian. It, it helped to preserve and, and to supervise and to discipline and to teach the people of Israel for this time. Right? That, that's the uh, connection he's making here. But then, here's the main point, that now that Christ has come, they're no longer under that guardian, right? Now that Christ has come, right, he says, the law was our guardian until Christ came. And so now that Christ has come, we're no longer imprisoned under the law. We're no longer under this guardian, but instead we are heirs according to the promise. And so here's his challenge, to the Galatians, is start acting like it. Because again, the whole point of Galatians is, is that they are no longer under this law. Now, understand, the law was never meant to be a means of salvation, but there was a misunderstanding that had crept into the Jewish people that uh, that is, in fact, how they could attain salvation, was through uh, works of the law. But it was never meant to be that way, right? Again, going back to Abraham. Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. We're saved by faith. The law had its function, but it was never a way for us to work our way to heaven, right? So just let me say this real clearly because I know, man, you guys have been great. This has been probably the most difficult passage maybe that we have ever looked at, okay? So we're getting into lots of technicalities, but just let me say this real simply, you cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot gain salvation through following the law, through being good, right? That's, that's the main point, right? It comes through faith in Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise that was made 2,000 years before to Abraham, 4,000 years ago for us now. God's timeline <laughs> is a lot longer than, than ours, isn't it? So, Paul's laboring to say, yeah, you're no longer under the law. The, the law had its time and place, but it was, it's not, or, and never has it been a means of salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. For the law was given not to replace the promise given to Abraham, but to prepare the people of God for it. And that comes through Christ. The fulfillment of this promise is in Christ. All right, so... I've, I've noted many times now that this sermon is, uh, or this, this passage is probably the most difficult section in Galatians. So let me just end with something much more simple. A children's song. You know, Father Abraham, 
Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Hey, we had a few sing with me. All right. So, and you do the right arm, left arm, all that. Okay. So that's one of those things that I didn't understand until I was a freshman in college. I didn't understand what that meant. And maybe some of you this morning don't understand what that means, and that's fine, right? Again, that, uh, I was sharing just in, this, uh, in the beginning of this Wednesday night study that I had, I had a woman in my last church who came to me. She had been in the church for 50 years, and she said, you know what? I've never really understood how all these stories fit together. Well, um, honing in here on Abraham, we see that the connection between Abraham and Christ is that there was a promise made to Abraham, and while there was a near fulfillment of that with the people of Israel, the ultimate fulfillment was in Christ, this seed, this offspring that would come through Abraham's lineage. And through Jesus, through this seed, all the families of the world would be blessed. Or look at verse 29. It says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, right? That's, that's why we can say, Father Abraham had many sons, right? I'm Abraham's offspring because I'm in Christ and because Christ is the seed of Abraham. So again, verse 29, if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And next week we'll pick up on this whole theme of heirs and, and, and what it means to be an heir of the promise. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the richness of your word. Um, some, sometimes uh, it, uh, it challenges us. Uh, of course, it challenges us in our obedience to it, but uh, sometimes even in our understanding of it. And so, uh, God, we uh, thank you for your spirit, and, and we pray that your spirit will just continue to help us to understand. Of course, we know that we also have the responsibility to, to dig deep and, and to, to work to understand your word. And so I pray, Lord, that we've all... Uh, come some way this morning and understanding this difficult passage and seeing uh, just the, the beauty of the gospel within it, that in Christ, that we are heirs of the promise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we uh, sing this closing song?